Okay, sure. okay, thank you all very much for coming. Um, as all of you are now well aware, Melissa, Laura, and I are going to speak about women in paddle sports. We're going to share our experiences. We're going to share some of our observations. And then at the, um, at the end, we're going to talk about what we're doing to hopefully encourage more women and just more people into paddle sports. And then we hope if there's enough time to talk a little bit about why different demographics, specifically women, may be underrepresented in paddle sports. There are a lot of ladies here. Okay, so I got an email. Many of you were at the talk that Laura and I gave, I think about two months ago, on our trip to Taiwan. So I flew home from Taiwan, I opened up my email, and I think Ken had sent me a request to speak to that. And I am so excited. I just got home from Taiwan. I've been on this amazing trip. I can't wait to tell you all about it. And he's like, can you talk about women in paddle sports? And I said, sure, I will. <laughs> but I've got this other really cool talk. So hopefully you enjoy the last talk that Laura and I gave, um, and we will entertain you again this evening with our good friend Melissa. So I agreed to give this talk under one condition that I could bring with me Melissa and Laura for both moral support and so you don't have to listen to me talk the entire time. <laughs> So I'll share my background. Um, most of you know me, but for those who don't, um, I grew up on the East Coast. I started kayaking in high school. That picture up in the upper right-hand corner might be the first time I ever sat in a sea kayak, or a kayak at all, for that matter. I was introduced to kayaking from a guy I was dating. I left him behind, and I continued <laughs> to kayak. I Graduated from undergrad in 2000, oh, 1999, yeah. <laughs> out and I moved out to the San Juan Islands with another guy um, that I was dating, and I worked for SeaQuest Expeditions, and Zoetic Research is what the name of the company was called back then, and it was run by a woman named Martine Springer, who's been to the San Juan Islands before. Yeah. Hey, that is a really amazing place. Yeah. And if you aren't already in love with kayaking, specifically sea kayaking, you will be once you spend an entire season guiding there. Yeah. So I guided two, three, and five day kayaking and camping trips. I went from barely knowing like the front end of a kayak to being a, a pretty, I thought, proficient paddler. Martine was very encouraging of women and there were a lot of strong female guides. The majority of the guides that were leading these overnight trips were actually women, um, and they were some of the guides that had been with the company the longest. Um, the newer guides, less experienced guides, happened to actually be primarily men. Um, so that was you know, a very encouraging experience for me, um, right, right at the beginning of my paddle sports um, education. And that picture on the Left is Martine, and then at the bottom is the very first overnight trip I ever led. And I was pretty sure everyone was going to think I was a fraud, but it went great. <laughs> so after my season with Sequest, I fell in love with paddling, but as so many young 20-somethings do, they go back to grad school. So I got a master's and a PhD, took about a 10-year leave of absence from working in paddle sports, and I would see kayaking back on the East Coast in Rhode Island, and then in Louisiana while I was working on my PhD, purely for pleasure. Um, fast forward to 2014, I left my education, if you will, behind, and I started working full-time for California Canoe and Kayak. Um, so I work there Monday through Friday. I do the buying for the stores, if you're worried about them not having products. Yeah. Speak to me. Um, in addition to doing the buying for California Canoe and Kayak, I teach classes um, both for California Canoe and Kayak, River and Ocean now, and then also for Melissa and the women's, um, the California Women's Water Sport Collective. So I'm, um, I'm on the water a lot. 
probably, I would say, about three to four times a week I kayak, which is, I think, a, 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 yeah, a privilege. I'm very lucky. And I spend a lot of time, guys, on the water. And I think it may be a combination of the type of kayaking that I really like, which is rock gardening and surfing and I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. But I do see a lot of men um, as my peers, um, both when I'm kayaking for pleasure um, and when I'm teaching. Teaching is also enjoyable. That came out. <laughs> So, I gave a talk similar to this without Melissa and Laura, unfortunately, about a year ago for the Western Sea Kayakers. And I was curious if, you know, maybe I don't notice a lot of men paddling with me, but maybe there are, excuse me, I don't notice a lot of women paddling with me, but maybe they're out there. They're, they're clearly with Bass. Um, so, I was wondering who's taking sea kayaking classes? I have a scientific background. So I decided to pull some data together from California Canoe and Kayak and then from River and Ocean. And the data that I'm going to show you are organized by the American Canoe Association's levels. So they start at level one, which is your introduction to kayak touring, sea kayaking, um, that's your calm water. And then you move up to level five, which is um, increasing conditions as far as wind, swell, surf, um, current. So you can think of it as level one is fun and easy to level five, which is challenging and exhilarating. Don't worry about all the descriptions. <laughs> okay, so I looked at the students for classes for 2015 and 16. <coughs> I apologize, I didn't have time to collect 2017's data. Um, but what you'll notice is that right in the beginning, there's kind of an equal number of men and women taking classes. And then as soon as you get into level two for the ACA is really your first sea kayak class. It's the first time you learn how to do a self and an assisted rescue. And right away you see the number of women relative to men decreases. But that ratio remains relatively constant throughout the next mm. four levels, which I was surprised by. I look around when I teach a level five class sometimes, and there are no women to be found. It's all men. So that was kind of interesting. Mm. So I was curious, and I have access to data from the American Canoe <coughs> Association. Oh. What about the instructors? Is the ratio yeah, right. similar? <laughs> So what you'll notice is that there aren't a lot of women teaching. I don't know where they all are. Um, if we average all the numbers together, we're looking at about 25% of the instructors, and this is in California, are women, while 75% are men. So in addition to sea kayaking, I love surfing. I love competitive kayak surfing. I love competing in general. Anything and everything, you name it. So there's a lot of guys in competitive surf kayaking. Um, I've done several competitions now. There have been times when I've been the only woman of all the competitors, and the rest have been men. Um, I took the data from Santa Cruz Paddle Fest, which is the largest paddle surf competition in the United States, I took data for two years. If you look at the expert categories, so the advanced paddlers, only 16% are women. And I know them all very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. It's me and three other people. <laughs> Lucy doesn't compete anymore, but I love Lucy. She's fantastic. Um, so, I met Melissa in 2016, I think, and um, I'm gonna let her talk a little bit about the efforts that all three of us have to bring more women both into sea and surf kayaking. Um, but I'm gonna share several really inspiring things that I've noticed just this summer. Um, in my sea kayaking classes, so specifically, um, level four and level five sea kayaking classes that I have taught this summer, I've seen over 50% women, um, which I think is outstanding. Um, several of them are in this room. Um, and I was really 
really excited when there was a class in August. It was level five, three days on the open coast with Bill Vonnegut and myself. It was almost all women. I loved it. Um, I've also noticed a lot of women really excited about surfing and surf kayaking and the introductory surf kayak classes that I teach. Um, other way. Perfect, right there, stop. <laughs> you got it. Um, my surf kayak classes, um, they almost have about 50% women, which is really, I, that's inspiring, and I hope that from that, it does. Uh huh. It's magic. It's automatic. To. Totally. Um, I'm hoping to start to see more women potentially compete in the competitions with me. So um, there are now about 50% women if we look at the intermediate class in Santa Cruz Paddle Fest, and I hope to see that reflect someday as they gain more experience to start competing in the expert class. Um, so that's a little bit about my experiences. I'm going to turn it over to Laura next. here for a bit. Uh, a lot of you guys may remember me from a few months ago. I'm Lara Zolliger. Um, I went to Taiwan with Kelly. Um, and I, I can give you a brief introduction of my history in paddle sports. Uh, so I grew up in coastal Georgia, uh, a small island called Tybee Island, right on the South Carolina Georgia border. Um, and when I was in high school, my dad was tired of me just being a beach rat, <laughs> and said, you gotta get a job. And I just, um, I, I went to high school out in Seattle, so my mom lived in Seattle, my dad lived in Georgia, coastal Georgia. So I'd spend school years with my mom in Seattle and then summers with my dad. Uh, and so I was really lucky, this uh, really amazing high school I was going to in Seattle had an Alaska trip. Um, and it was kind of a rite of passage for sophomores to be able to go on this month-long trip to Southeast Alaska. Wow. And so I jumped at the opportunity to do it, and of course, similar to the San Juans, if you paddle there, it's, it's you know, a formula. You're going to be addicted no matter what. Mm -hmm. So I came back to Georgia, addicted to sea kayaking, made my first ever resume, walked up the steps of Sea Kayak Georgia really confidently, and um, left with a job. But the only question they really asked me was, how far along in school are you? And I said, I'm, I'm going to be a junior in the fall. And they thought that meant college. <laughs> <laughs> I always looked old. I don't know if it came across in our presentation about Taiwan. Some people thought I was Kelly's mom in Taiwan. <laughs> um, I'm just being open about that. At first, I told her not to tell anyone. <laughs> So they, they thought I was in college, but I was in high school, and my birthday is in the summer. Um, so up until my birthday, I was getting a lot of hands-on experience with guiding, a little bit of light instruction. Um, nobody wanted to be on Girl Scout troop trips, but I loved them. Um, so they put me on a lot of Girl Scout troop trips. Um, and then my birthday rolled around in July, and I was like, guys, it's my birthday! And they're like, oh, it's so great, how old are you? And I was like, I'm 16! <laughs> <laughs> and then this is after I've been driving like the nine passenger van on <laughs> I wasn't upfront about a lot of things. I because I was so I was too I think ignorant and naive to tell them that that mattered. Like I'm driving a nine person passenger van on a permit. I <laughs> I'm wondering like why I would clip mailboxes with the trailer <laughs> the trailer wheel down and then they're like oh so in the span of like a month, all of those responsibilities were stripped away due to insurance reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing a lot of retail for the rest of the summer oh rather than guiding. But it didn't it didn't hinder the scope that was developing. So I came back again another summer um, to to guide again and learn more. And then was lucky enough to um, go to a college up in North Carolina that had a really, really strong outdoor program. So the, and then I continued in college to work in the summers for the college outdoor program and also for Seekite Georgia. At the time I was at Seekite Georgia, it was ran by a man 
I really, really get the head coach, Dale Williams. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Dale Williams. He does more on the East Coast. Um, and the ownership transition from Dale to a really lovely female coach, Marcia Henson. And similar to Kelly, I'm just now realizing it while we're talking, uh, most of the perennial coaches and instructors at the higher levels at CKI George at the time were women and female coaches. So that was really inspiring, and that it was really great to have your first introduction be like, oh, this isn't even a thing. Like, I didn't even know that the lack of representation in CKI was a thing until later on. So I, I was really lucky to have that encouragement. And then in college, it was reinforced. Because uh, Davidson, I went to a small school called Davidson College. Most people know about it because of Steph Curry. <laughs> I don't play basketball. <laughs> All right, that's a follow-up question. They're like, I don't understand. You don't look like you're good at basketball. It's like, most people don't play basketball there. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah, he's a rare breed. Um, so uh, at, at Davidson Outdoors, it was very 50-50. Um, there was a lot of encouragement of both genders, uh, even on the individual uh, personality uh, learning basis beyond gender. And that was just a really wonderful environment to become not just a paddler, but an outdoor leader. And, and they really developed people in that way um, to plug in that sense of risk management and confidence and competence, whether it's leading a backpacking trip or a whitewater trip or a rafting trip, um, making those skills really honed and modular. And a lot of that was inspired by the ACA pedagogy. Um, and so that was a really great experience. And I was able to uh, get a grant to do my first ever IDW. And I went back to see Kai Georgia to do my, my IDW ICE. And I was the only woman. And that's when I was like, oh, this is weird. This is the first time I've been in the only woman in a, a paddle sports uh, or a paddling class or teacher training. Um, and, and that's where I realized, oh, OK. And I had my first dose of, uh, of I think some of the things that we'll talk about later that I think could sometimes hinder women from being encouraged to go further. Um, and so that was a great experience. I returned to Davidson and started with another friend a sea kayaking program within our small outdoor club. And that was really great to start plotting out trips that are they're still running uh, today to the Georgia coast and the South Carolina and North Carolina coast. So, um, and then similar to Kelly, I took a hiatus. I moved to China for, for two years and lived in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> You don't really want to be in the rivers there. <laughs> um, and uh, when I came back, I, I finished the program I was in China for, and I beelined it for the Bay Area, and immediately ran into Keith, and he convinced me to start instructing for him the day I met him. <laughs> so um, Aaron, I bet you might have a similar experience, Keith, Keith recruitment style. Um, and I think beyond that, I was given a lot of opportunities through CCK to, to get more training, to do more IDWs, to do more, get more hands-on experience, shadow some really excellent instructors, both male and female. Um, and the Bay Area, the community here is like very strong. I think it's very noticed that Basque has a, lot, a strong female representation. Um, but there are some things that I've started to notice, starting in that IDW back when I was a freshman in college. Um, and then I did another Whitewater IDW in college as well. Um, I really love IDWs, if you have <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where And then also working in the shop and teaching a lot. There, there's some things that would start to uh, get in my head a little bit. Like, do you be working in the shop? and you'd be the person on the floor with the most experience, but then a, a male client comes in and you ask them if they need help, and they, they say no, and then you see them kind of make their way to the other male employee to get their <laughs> take on something, and the other male employee is like, I don't know, and then they're like, go ask her, and they, they never end up asking me. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, it's 
Because I'm intimidating? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. No. I'm intimidating. Um, or you're teaching a class, and uh, an, a, another paddler stops you in the middle of your class to show you a skill. <laughs> this has happened once, where I was teaching a draw stroke, and um, a, a gentleman was like, well, you know, you don't need to keep it in the water when you're, I was teaching an in-water recovery, and he's like, you can just take it out and snap it back, and that's the, that's the, that's the draw. And I was like, no, <laughs> ignore that, <laughs> students. Um, so there are small things like that that I'm sure you guys have heard the, the phrase, death by a thousand cuts where it's, it's not something that, it, like one off, you can excuse it, you can talk about it, but when it happens an overwhelming amount of times where you see over and over again the, the husband telling his wife dangerous information when you're the, the instructor that's like countering what you just told your class. You're like, oh, I think there's a pattern here. Um, and it's not as, I, I don't mean to make it sound pervasive, but it's something that I think I've built an awareness of to the point where sometimes in all male environments, when I'm the only female kayaker, I'll go out of my way to prove that I can do something or not fulfill stereotypes in any way. Um, and that, I'm speaking mostly from my own experience. I know that it varies, and a lot of a lot of women have different experiences in paddle sports. But I sometimes, especially the older I get, and Right now, I'm especially triggered with Donald Trump in office, where I'm just like, God, damn. I don't think that would happen if I were a man. And I think those things kind of bristle me a little more than they have in the past. So we'll see how it develops. But I think that's, that's something that personally I'm working on, is like getting past seeing it through a gender lens in, in some cases. But I think right now I'm, I'm in a really great position in paddle sports. I, I teach with CCK. I teach a ton with California um, Women's Water Sports Collective. And um, yeah, uh, I think I, I've gone past what I was wanting to talk about here. So here's Davidson Outdoors. I did a lot of whitewater canoeing as well. Um, and this is the first uh, whitewater IDW. That's me, the, the woman in the back. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is all female teaching and learning environments. Uh, so it wasn't until I met Melissa and she told me about the first ever women's whitewater clinic she was organizing on the South Fork um, that I had heard about an all women's paddle sports class. And so I went as a student the first year um, and I had never seen that many women on the water in my life. Uh, where do all these people live? <laughs> Especially all the instructors. I, I was amazed. Where did Melissa meet all of these incredibly skilled class five female boaters that are also brilliant instructors? Because it's one thing to be a class five boater. It's not a thing to be a class five boater and be an amazing teacher and instructor. Um, so I was blown away and immediately became a fangirl of 3D. I tried to go to everything. Um, and I was reflecting on what I love about teaching, especially in those environments. Um, and I think there's something really energizing and easy about teaching women for me, where w what I've noticed is women have, tend to have, are conditioned to have, in a lot of sense, more body awareness, uh, more flexibility. Um, they think they want to grasp something mentally, wholly, before they do go right. for it, yeah. Um, and with that being the, not everyone, with that being the trend, that's, some, that's the same way that I learned and I understand. So to teach to that is really fulfilling and easy. And I think what's also therapeutic about it is you're teaching women who I think, um, how do I say this? I think sometimes, it, depending on what they do, have to put up with a lot of shit. And so to be in an environment where they can grasp their own strength and um, do it in a way that uh, opens up a new world uh, is really great. Because I think for especially many generations, I don't know if it's as true for my generation, There's, it's been harder to break into a lot of traditional sports. And so to have a non-traditional sport be so much more accessible and that 
be connected to and exploring the natural world in a really special way, I think is, is almost like spiritual for me. So to be able to help people be a facilitator for realizing that strength is, is one of my favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pass it on to Melissa. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Hi, I'm Melissa. I like kayaking. Um, so I am different from pretty much everyone here. Um, my background is in whitewater. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are sorts of things that I enjoy falling off of. Um, <laughs> um, my, my, my educational background um, took an abrupt turn when I was on my way to law school and decided I was going to instead move to California. And that summer I became a raft guide and never looked back. Um, since then, um, the whitewater industry, I've been a guide, an instructor, uh, photographer, and it has taken me all over the world. I've worked on six continents. Um, places from New Zealand to Patagonia to the Himalayas, the Nile, um, and beyond. And so it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty wild ride. Um, this is just in our backyard. This is in the Sierras um, in California. It's on the middle fork of the feather. And then one more big one. That's up in um, that's up in Hood River. So. Um, on purpose. Um, <laughs> I started as a guide, and um, it's, it was always a boys club, you know, and everything I've done, skiing, snowboarding, mountain biking, um, I like dancing, but that's about the only activity I've done where there's been more girls than guys, but um, it's always been a boys club, and for me, it was always fine, because I can rally, and I'd hang, and it would be all good, um, and some things got trickier. Um, learning to guide harder rivers and things like that, there were just certain, there were certain disconnects. Like, I'm just not as long, I'm not as tall, I, my muscles aren't as big. Um, and I had a woman once say to me, well, why don't you put a, a piece of webbing underneath your boat? And I was like, no, the boys don't do that. And she's like, are you six feet tall? No. Are you gonna flip your raft? Yes then rig something so you can get back on it. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so a little eye-opening straight off the bat. But um, whitewater took me everywhere. Um, Uganda, I spent time on the White Nile. Um, this rapid uh, is called Silverback. It is sadly no longer there due to a big dam that they built. It is now under a lake. Um, and traveling in these kinds of countries, Nepal, um, being in the Himalayas and, and hiking your boats into just these absolutely phenomenal runs. A lot of the, the classic trekking routes that people do, this is a little known secret, you can get someone to carry your boat up. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to walk back down, you just slide down in the water, it's awesome. Um, but it's interesting because you, know, you take you know, all the things that you deal with as a woman and then you add it to a, a different culture. Um, which has always been really interesting. I remember getting to um, my first day on the job um, down in Patagonia on the Futalufu, and it's a, it's a big volume river, gorgeous if you guys are ever down there. I highly recommend it, get in a raft, enjoy the ride. But I'm there, I'm rigging my boat, and this Chilean came, comes over to me and says, you know this is a very powerful river. I was like, mm-hmm, <laughs> carry on, rigging my boat. He's like, no, no. It's very strong. Thank you. <laughs> and he's clearly getting irritated, but I just get smiling. And finally goes, you're a very small girl. I got this. And it kind of went one right after the other. No matter, you know, whether it's California, this is in Norway. Um, actually, about a month into getting my job in Norway, I was really excited about it. and. Um, which is a traditionally really hard place to get a job because as a kayaker, you want to work in Norway. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat and not hit a waterfall. I mean, the quality white water is just amazing out there. And I got this job in Norway and we were talking about it one day and I was like, man, I don't know how I got this job. And my ops manager says, well, we needed a girl. 
that knew how to raft. And it was just this thing where it just completely deflated, you know, and totally took away from the fact that I could run the rivers just as well as anyone I worked with. But in that tiny little cut, it's like, he got me and it just, okay. You know, and you stand there and smile and then you slowly start backing away from the crowd. And, um, and, and just, you know, and it's fine to a degree. And I mean, you know, clearly I can hang. You know, clearly I can boat, clearly I can raft. Um, I can handle all the safety things. I've taken about a thousand and one rescue courses. I've been involved in some really interesting rescues over the year. I've done two helicopter broken back evacs out of really steep canyons. Um, confident in my skills, but you're always still, you know, you're always still the girl. You know, this, you're, you're, you're the token girl. And you do, you wind up having to prove yourself over and over and over again. You know, where somebody else, it's like, okay, we're good. It's entire seasons of, you know, and the odd thing is, is having to do it with a smile. Like, no, 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 it's okay, I got this. Um, you get to do fun things like buy food. This is always a really fun one in a foreign country, especially as a female, because you're already a spectacle and then you have to buy food for your trip. And so trying to break through those barriers, not only you know, gender, but culturally. Um, I have had, and I continue to have, an amazing time lapping the world and meeting incredible people and seeing beautiful places. Um, it started to get to a point where I felt like something was missing. And I have done a few, I had done a few programs in the past. Thing, you know, I started to think about things that were inspiring to me. Um, and the things that resonated with me the most were programs that I had done for women. Um, whether it was at a family center in Vermont, teaching teenage moms how to cook nutritious meals, to spending time in Nicaragua, which is where these are, photos are from, um, at a women's clinic where we would go um, out to the outlying colonias and talk to women and try to get them to come in to the clinic, and not only for medical treatment, but we would do things like teach sewing classes and you know, just give them other opportunities to, to, to get out there and you know, get out of the home and, um, and learn new skills. And so, you know, as the thought process starts, keeps, keeps going and keeps going, it's like, how do I put together a couple of passions? And Cali Collective is what I came up with. Um, California Women's Water Sport Collective was founded three years ago. Um, I kind of refer to myself as the instigator. Um, because I really believe that there's a value in women learning from other women. Um, we process things differently, we think about things differently, we learn differently, we communicate differently. It's not good or bad or otherwise, we just are, we're totally different creatures. And creating an environment where we have the space where, yeah, you can, you know, ask the questions that you might not ask in front of the guys, because I know there was a lot of times that I would be on the side of the river looking at a big rapid, and I'm like, <sighs> And nobody's saying anything, you know? Like, is nobody else scared here? <sighs> and then, there would, you know, that would happen, it'd be like one girl on the trip, and we'd look at each other, I'm super scared, are you scared? Yeah, I'm scared. Okay, cool. And then we'd go run it, and it'd be fine. But it just, being able to be open and have that communication really made a big difference. Um, so, what we were doing, at, you know, in the California Women's Water Sport Collective, Cali Collective for short, um, that's what we do. We create a space for women um, where you can learn, grow, um, and, and connect with other women. Essentially, I kind of refer to it as a community building organization. Paddle sports just happens to be the medium. These are, so these are gonna be a mix of whitewater and sea kayaking. We did a, a surf uh, play boating clinic at Barking Dog. This is kind of the first organized event we did, um, there was a wave on the river. We're like, okay, we'll, we'll do this. We hope maybe five people showed up and 30 women showed up. Okay. Um, we've since run rescue courses, all women's rescue courses. 
uh, which really gives women an opportunity to get hands-on into a lot of these scenarios. Um, on a lot of levels, men are quicker to jump in, into the, the leadership role. You know, because you want to be ideally bigger, stronger, if you're going to be in a rescue situation. And so in a lot of these classes, okay, we got, who wants to be the incident commander? And usually a guy jumps in there. When you have an all-women's class, well, you, you have no choice. And so it really afforded women an opportunity to, to, you know, have that experience. You know, our bodies move differently, we're shaped differently. And, um, and just really being, under, being able to understand and be understood, I think, is really valuable. And these are just some more, some of our different clinics that we do. We integrate um, not just, it's not just paddling when we do our clinics. We like to look at things at, at a more holistic view. Um, so generally, especially on the multi-day clinics, we have things incorporated like yoga, Pilates. A lot of times we'll have different workshops, whether it's nutrition or essential oils or um, something that rounds out that experience. Because realistically, as, um, you know, as a paddler, it's not all about kayaking. And if it is, then you do things like yank your shoulder out of the socket and then you're laid up for a while. Um, so we try to take a holistic approach to it. And the women that, that teach these, that teach the yoga classes are part of the community, they're paddlers, and so they understand exactly what we need to stay healthy. And then just camaraderie. Being able to, you know, hang out on the beach and have a glass of wine at the end of the night and chit chat and make friends. And, you know, it was really neat after the, the, first, the first big cl clinic that we did on the South Fork, for weeks afterwards, I would run into women and they would be like, this is amazing. I didn't know anybody. And now I come to the river and know everybody. And it's really cool to see. It's over the last three years I've seen friendships made, um, bonds formed, um, and because we create this environment where women get together and hang out. So what's next? It's all experience. And this is one of our instructors. She was very pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> but we do things like loading and unloading our own boats. We learn about rescue techniques. And everyone gets hands-on experience with it. And with experience comes confidence. It's really empowering to see women come up to, you know, learn a technique. And you can see everyone's face is nervous. They don't want to try. It's scary. And then they do. And then it's amazing just the, the change in face that you see. Like, wow, I feel really empowered. Because if you could do that, then who knows what else you can do. And so this, you know, what we're creating here, and this, these are more of the, the women's rescue clinics. And, you know, we're making the decisions. And it's offering women an opportunity to be the one that makes a decision and has experience with something. And it's empowering, and it gives you a lot of confidence. You know, you're not following, you know, you're not always having to follow your boyfriend or your, you know, your husband. You're looking out for each other. Um, the girl in the orange boat was learning how to safety kayak. So we gave her a raft to look out for. But mostly it's fun. <laughs> Honestly, it's just great to get together with a group of women and... And, and do something non-traditional, you know? Get out into rough waters, get out into calm waters, get out, just get out and do something. Um, yay, see it's fun. <laughs> that was from our, we did a 10 day trip in Chile last year. We had nine women for 10 days. It was amazing. And it was super fun because we did, um, again, with integrating other things other than paddling um, on this trip, we spent three different days at different indigenous communities. And so we'd paddle in the morning and in the afternoons. We'd go to a different Mapuche community and learn, you know, how they, you know, how they made a living and, you know, what they did. And oddly enough, 
all of the communities were run by women. <laughs> so it was really neat. And sometimes it's fun just to put on a tutu and be a girl. And those are things that don't always happen with the boys. <laughs> and it gives you the opportunity to try things you may not have wanted to try before. If you notice the assortment of boats in the surf kayaking clinic, it's, sometimes it just doesn't matter. And, you, and it's good to be okay with just going for it and getting out there. And I think when you're with a, with a group that you feel com comfortable and confident with, you're more likely to just get out there and go for it. All right. We talked about who, you know, the women, we're stoked on women. Um, what we've noticed through our years together that we often see lower participation among women um, in paddle sports. Um, and we've kind of talked a little bit or a lot in Melissa's case about how we can encourage, you know, women and just more people to paddle. Um, Melissa sent me a text earlier this week and she's like, we don't talk about the why. We don't talk about the why. Why don't more women paddle? And I think this can be a very sensitive subject. I also think um, I am a woman and I do paddle, so I, I can't necessarily answer that question. Um, but we thought this might be a good opportunity to hear from some people in the audience, you know, whether you are male or female, you know, if you have thoughts on it, um, or if you, you know, can share an experience, we're very open to hear that. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. So, I started paddling with Barbara Sierra. Um, we, we met Barbara Williamson, who just mentioned. We met in a postnatal yoga class, and our kids are not 28, so they're like two months old. And she was dating somebody who's also near Bo Barnes, and back in uh, whatever, our kids were born in 89. So, we took the kayak. And then we did kayaking together for about three years. And then all of a sudden, you know, our kids we got older. Then it was Saturday through Sunday, at least for me, with the boy and she with the girl. I spent all my lucky got into playing soccer and basketball and all that shit. Basically, I didn't kayak. No, it's not shit, but. <laughs> well, it's not shit, but I, we enjoyed it. But I didn't kayak again until about 2008. I joined Basque in 2009. He graduated high school in 2007, so now I was free. I only have one kid. I had him at 37. And I wanted to do something, so I joined Basque in 2009. I took the skills clinic in 2010. In 2011, I did the ETC training, so now I'm a volunteer for them. And um, so it's been great ever since. And Barbara, I told Barbara about ETC, and she did, did the skills clinic, and now we're back together as friends. And we had our separate careers. She's a midwife, and I'm a... I just retired from UC, she retired from being a midwife, and now we have time to do it. But I noticed in your, in your pictures, um, so I love it, you know, and I, I came to it really, I mean, I, I started sort of at, at 38, but and then I came to it again in, at, in my 50s, or late 50s. So I noticed everybody in your pictures seemed to be younger women, which is great, but there's a lot of us older women here in Basque. I mean, you know, a lot of us that we're looking around and we've all got our gray hair, so we've earned it, right? Or those of us who still have, who didn't decide to dye it, but we're all in the, like, we're all in the about retirement age, okay? So we're like kayaking, but I wondered if, number one, if you do anything, if you have older women in your groups, which I think is fabulous that you're doing it. And one of the problems in this club is that we're all over, well, I'm 66, and I'd say the average age of most of the members, with a few exceptions, is about 60, right? So we're always having the issue of trying to get younger people to come on our trips. And when we do have like 25 year olds show up, they're sort of like, we're a bunch of old fogies. The only place that I do young people is with ETC as a volunteer because there's a lot of people that have done environmental education. And they all majored in like a thing that didn't exist when we were in college. And they're all these, like, I go out on weekends with them and they're 25 year olds and 26 year olds and I'm the oldest person in that group. So I'm just wondering, you know, 
it's sort of a disconnect between all of us. Well, I, I don't want to put you all in that same group. Most of us are <laughs> retirement age or you're younger, kind of, okay. All of us are retired, and yet there's a disconnect in Basque, and there's a lot of women involved in Basque, but half the audience here is women, yet we, we somehow can't get the younger people into the group, and you seem to have a lot of younger people, which is fabulous, you know. So I'm just saying they're sort of, so I'm glad to see, number one, they're younger people. I know there's younger people doing it because they're all doing it in ETC. We have all these, we have like, uh, high school kids that get involved in a leadership training mm -hmm. thing. So they get kids from the public schools in the city. So anyway, I'll stop there. I'm just saying too much. But I'm just wondering, <laughs> it's like, it seems like all your people are younger than, than the average age of the basketball. I'm going to let Melissa talk in just one second. Okay. So one thing um, that I do know is we were talking a little bit about this is a, people, I've been a BASC member for three years, and people always wonder where I am when the paddles come around. I, know. Um, I think some of it is with those of us that maybe work full time in paddle sports. It, it can be. So a lot of your instructors may be younger, but when you're all paddling together, we're teaching. <laughs> so anyways, but I'm going to let Melissa talk a little bit more. Yeah. Things. Um, we do have a we do have a big mix for sure. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, there there are a lot of slides of younger um, folks, and then there's also a lot of slides of not younger folks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we we definitely it's funny we definitely run the range. Um, a lot of our clinics the age spread will be you know, 22 to 67. On the trip to Chile, uh, the age spread was 24 to 68. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yes? I just wanted to make a correction to your, oh, your data. Oh, I just counted. There are 12 women in the audience and 23 men. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, it's not 50. <laughs> Okay, so that's but, but thank you, but yes, but I mean, but it's still more than, than it would be otherwise. Okay. So, no, but I think it's worth. I want to add what Ellen said, and that is the ratio of men to women in Basque has always been about oh twice as many men as women, yeah. and that's always been one of the big selling points. <laughs> 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 But just to but just to, to just to wrap up on your question, um, I did when I put the slides together. I try I did try to do a mix. Yeah. I know. Well, the, it's funny because that's what these girls said. They're like, oh, we got we got a we. But we it's funny that we we are hitting that range, and I'm not sure why, but we're definitely hitting a range. You should come hang with us. Yeah, I know. I was bummed when I saw the Susan Marlene Trudy. Susan's here, but. Yes. So I, my experience in Bath, it's not really about age. Because mm -hmm. in my experience, I joined in 2002, then um, attended rescue practices right away. Yeah. And for a year or two, I was the only woman out there usually. Yeah. And now it's about 50 50. Yeah. Or even more women than in rescue stuff. In it's teaching the client. It and has it. changed. It comes, it comes in waves, it seems. Right? Yep. My question would rather be. You know, how do you transfer that all women experience that you have during like all women rescue practices, which like Ellen and I have also organized and which was a great experience, but how do you transfer that in, uh, into real life where you paddle with your, your male friends, which usually have the louder voice and when it comes to situations, they take over. <laughs> you I wish I could answer that question for you. Um, what? <laughs> that that if if I could answer that question, that would solve a lot of problems. Um, I think what what happens, what, how it translates from having the all women's classes into real life, is that women have the opportunity to have the experience of getting in there and doing it instead of it always kind of being the same. And no offense to all you guys, but generally this is kind of what happens. And you know. I'm, I'm pretty assertive, and so, but even at that, I still had to fight to get myself in. Where when you have these classes, and we don't, they don't get dumbed down. 
You know, we're still kicking your ass. <laughs> but you also have the opportunity in your peer group to have the experience doing things because you know what? Yes, in a rescue situation, size matters. If you're holding somebody's head out of the water for 45 minutes, yeah, you want someone, you want the biggest, strongest person, but you know what? You may be the only person there with that experience, and that's the difference, and, that how it's, and that's how it translates. Because when it comes to real life, and something does go down, and you look around your group, and everyone kind of freezes, and you're like, I've done this, that at least gives you that confidence to step forward, yes? Oh. Just um, to touch on what you were asking about how you can take a leadership role when you're paddling with a mixed gender group, I've often, when I'm trying to get experience before I do an instructor certification, will look at the group when we're doing the pre-paddle talk and say, hey, you know, I'm getting ready for this certification. I'd really like to take a leadership role today. You know, if there's an opportunity for a rescue, I'd like to try to head this up. You know, I wanna, I wanna be looked to as, as the leader, so both you could do it from the standpoint of initiating the paddle, but also from being very upfront about it in the beginning, saying, you know, I have this experience, I would like to put it to use today if there's an opportunity to give you that, you know, yeah. that chance. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So another thing that matters in a rescue is being the closest person there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you've had the training and you know what to do and you're right there, you just go do it. Whether you're Absolutely. five foot five or it's six foot five. Absolutely. Yeah. Five foot one. Yes, oh, sorry. Sally. Five, two, four, or you can use the Sharon Fleming method, and she's not here tonight, but hers is, I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a lot of it is just, it's just, you know, it just being more assertive. Yes. You know, I, you know, I've been a member of BASC for about I don't know, six or seven years. One of the first things that uh, uh, that struck me uh, when I when I started coming to meetings was that all these women, and you go out paddling, and you find that, wait a minute, these women are better than the guys, or at least as good. And so maybe, I don't know if Basque is different in this way, but it's definitely more, it, we have a very large number of very skilled women paddlers. And well, so, we all grew uh, up in the 60s and we went through women's led. Well, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's always been a question to me. And, uh, mm -hmm. But it certainly struck me. Yeah, I don't, think it's a, I don't think really it's a question of quality. I think it's more of quantity. Um, and that's kind of where we're, you know, kind of where we're getting to is that, yeah, like quality-wise, we're good. Um, quantity-wise, it's... You know, which is why we, you know, why we're kind of getting into the why. And you know, one of the things that we're trying to do this year with Cali Collective, when we're starting a kids program in summer 2018, um, which is going to be amazing for mothers, and which is one of the whys. You know, I don't have kids; I have cats, which is why I get to paddle all the time. Um, <laughs> and I have a lovely husband that's really good at driving my shuttles. Um, but. Um, but that is, that is definitely a major hindrance, like you said. You know, you just, and, and, and women tend to be the ones to, you know, do, do the stuff. Um, so starting the kids program this year, one, we'll give, we'll get them out of the house. <laughs> um, and give, you know, mothers an opportunity to actually have some more freedom for themselves. The other thing that we're working on in conjunction with the kids program is we're trying to figure out how to organize some days where we allow women to get on the water and we, like, ones that have young kids. Okay, what can we do for a half a day where you get to be on the water with the other women that you've gone to these clinics with and your friends, and we take your young ones down a family float or, you know, to the park or something like that. And so again, just encouraging and, and creating that space even better. Now and I would babysit for the kids or take care of the kids. Get her numbers. number. Fantastic. <laughs> my number and my email. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. I've been from nowhere to the top of three male dominated professions mm -hmm. photography, um, white water rafting, and cross country skiing. And I have never found a place where there's less gender stuff going on than Basque. And I see here this place is full of strong women and men who not only 
they appreciate and enjoy and are comfortable with strong women. <coughs> it's just a really pleasant atmosphere. I don't see a lot of gender issue stuff going on, and I just wanted to, to share an appreciation of that. Awesome. It's really a wonderful situation. Yeah. That's that's been that's phenomenal, and you want. That's really a wonderful. <laughs> and I feel like you know I share you know we share our experiences, but you know obviously you know it seems like what you guys have here is is lovely, it and really that's does. I think it's fantastic. That's yeah. awesome. Yes. My comment is, you know, I, I'm appreciating the fact that we have such diversity, men and women here, but we don't have a diversity of ethnic groups. <laughs> and we don't have a diversity age-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, coming from an educational background, there's no outreach for sea sports, kayaking, swimming, things like that, to the minority groups. Mm -hmm. so, and, and that's why, you know, from all the, the things you yeah. see, you know, we're, we're all white, middle class, so <laughs> forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't see diversity in terms of ethnic groups and age. One of the things that we are working on, and it's been, we've been um, working on pretty much since the inception of, of Cali Collective, is this thing that we're, the working title is the Collective Outreach Program. And what the Collective Outreach Program is designed to do is to reach and do demographics of women um, that don't have the means, whether it's physically or financially, um, to get involved in these activities. Because doing things like this is healing. It's healing, it's empowering, and this is, you know, yeah, this is the demographic we generally see. And so what my hopes to do with the, with the outreach program is to, you know, whether it's a shelter or for better women or, you know, but it really getting into those other demographics that we don't see, middle, you know, middle class white folks. <laughs> so, but yes, that's, that is definitely in the works because I believe that it belongs to everybody. Yes. Um, Marine Outdoors up in Marin is directed towards the Latino community. Mm -hmm. And they've come out with BTC to environmental travel and companion mm -hmm. to get training for the park rangers and all that. One out of five uh, people that go to the parks are not white. And they're trying to make people feel like the parks are theirs. Mm -hmm. We won't have any parks if we don't get minority populations. <coughs> Mm -hmm. aware of the parks and they were using the park and all that and they were doing training so they could bring people out and introduce them to kayaking up in the wind. That was a Latino mm -hmm. organization. Fantastic. Yes. Um, from sort of first-hand uh, observation with uh, a college-age daughter and some of her friends, uh, they were intimidated about kayaking because they felt they weren't physically strong enough. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to sort of paddling and rambling slaughtered by Margot shooting at everybody. The finesse is really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that message uh, sort of filters through terribly easily to them. So if we're able to get that across. Yeah. Um, no, and that's... The and the way that we're going to trick them into getting into kayaking is <laughs> we're tricking them. Um, we, are, we are really boosting up our recreational program this year. Um, just in a couple weeks, we have a two-day bioluminescence trip. Uh, all women's on Tamales Bay. You know, we'll launch from Nick's Cove and paddle across, and we'll do yoga and make food and go on hikes. And then once the sun goes down, we'll paddle around some glowing bat rays and things like that. We're looking to do more things on like Elkhorn Slough and really accessible, non-intimidating, fun paddling. Because honestly, if you've never tried it, how do you know you like it? And a lot of people aren't going to jump into sea kayaking or surf kayaking or whitewater. I mean, it looks scary. It's big and intimidating. And so my theory is I want to buy a bunch of sit-on tops and do tons of lake days and slew days and, and things that are super accessible because the idea of the collective is to make it all inclusive. And that's young, old, um, you know, we haven't gotten yet into, you know, adaptive paddle sports. That's going to be a whole nother chapter. Um, but to make it accessible and, and recreational and flat water paddling is, we're going we're gonna to push hard on that one in, in 2018 as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly new program. You know, it's only three years old. You know, I started with whitewater because that's my passion. And then Kelly here talked me into coming out to the coast because she's like, well, the ladies out there need some 
more ladies too. And it's just, it's been tumbling, tumbling ever since. And the more I get into it, the more I'm finding these places. I'm like, ooh, they need, they want community. Oh, they want community. Like, she doesn't know that she likes kayaking, but I'm sure she would if she went out. So, um, yeah, these are, these are definitely all things that, you know, we're addressing in some, some level. <laughs> yes. woman who had this theory that a good kayak trip would not invite any spouses. <laughs> <laughs> so I opened that for Is that Andreas? <laughs> How do you guys feel about that? I thought it was great. That's, it depends on the spouse. It does depend on the spouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Personally, I was telling someone earlier, I actually I'm happy that my husband doesn't like to paddle the same level of whitewater because then I'm not distracted. You know, I got myself and my team and I'm, okay, cool, I don't have that like, ooh, is he all right? You know, um, but yeah, it does depend on the spouses. There was a woman that I met uh, the first year that we were together and, well, I'd met her boyfriend first and he took a class um, and all I heard from him was about his girlfriend and oh, she can't do this, and she can't do that, and she's really got to get better, and I try to tell her this, and I try to tell her that, and I'm like, mm-hmm, okay. You know, and I definitely listened and process, and I met her, and she was super rad. She was amazing. And, you know, he was the very classic, like, trying to hold her back. They're not together anymore. I think she's been hanging out with us too long. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely situational with the spouse thing. Because some spouses are great together. I have a couple friends, and it's like one of the few examples I've seen where she actually learned to kayak from her boyfriend, and they were high school sweethearts, and now they're in their early 40s and have two kids together and still kayak together. But that's rare. You know, generally, it's, it's the other way. Nobody likes to hear anything from their spouse. <laughs> like, yes? You said this, and I missed it. Have you offered women-only YCDs? Not yet. <laughs> We haven't we haven't gotten that that deep yet, but you know there's there's the one two five ten year, but um yeah we'll get there. Um, I mean there's there's amazing um, female assessors, so you know as soon as, but you know we got to build from the ground up, which is why literally two of the things that I'm focusing on the most for 2018 are kids, um, and. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Recreation, thank you. <laughs> because you got to build it from somewhere. Because what happens is you, you try to jump in the middle and you're like, where is everybody? But you, you, you cap out because there's, there's, there's the population of people that are already interested in it. And it's, you know, it's, it's fairly finite for the most part. What, what we're trying to do is get to those other people. And, you know, hopefully the girls go home and they tell their boyfriends, like, oh, this is super cool, we should go do this, and then they have something cool to do together as well. Or not, then they have their own things. But, you know, those are the, those are the big, big driving forces um, this up and coming year, because we're not going to get more surf kayakers or more whitewater paddlers if we don't just introduce people into the sport. This last year, at the, we did a, our two-day clinic on the South Fork American. We had 20 beginners, which... Even now I get chills thinking about it, because it's one thing when you're, when you're in your community and they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna come back, that was fun, I wanna learn more. But to have 20 women that had never sat in a whitewater kayak before show up, it's like, okay, I guess the message is getting out there. So, we're working on it. Yes? Um, I'm a reference to Kelly, since you've been more involved in the sea kayak. Sure. Do you have any suggestions of what, how bass could do better or do different things than we are now that would um, help further your goals? Does bass ever have like a bring your kid to sea kayak day? <laughs> because what's your college age daughter? Or is your college age daughter to, to spend time with you? Whatever you want to call it. How many people here have young have, I'm not young, but I mean like <laughs> in their Oops. teens to 30 age year old kids. Or okay, maybe some of your kids are older. You know, there's an opportunity there. They they may or may not 
fall in love with it, but at least they would see other young people on the water at the same time as them. Um, My daughter surfs, so you know, that's, that's her scene, because I think the kayaking, she never learned to kayak surfing, but she can appreciate it, but you know, her, her, her age group is more, more surfers. And there's a lot of, there's a growing group of women surfers, and she's yeah. really rocking. Yeah, yeah. sea kayaks require room. See, I think that sea kayaking mm -hmm. is tough because it requires room, and the cool. ability to transport it, and it's not an, an inexpensive sport to get into, so you need to have a job that allows you to buy these things, including a house big enough to have a garage. Yeah. Um, or you just put it on the top of your uh, trash stairwell like I did. For <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I have Aaron, you think you're hiding in the back, how, Erin, what are your suggestions to get more young people into sea kayaking? Because you see kayak. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did sea kayaking for a while, mostly recreationally. I can do it more now. Um, but it's a, a very good, I mean, it's a very good point, though, because I graduated from college two years ago, was living in a dorm for all four years. There's no chance I could have a, a boat with me. Um, it's only until actually this year when I moved into an apartment that I had a garage. <laughs> um, now I can have my boat with me and I can, you know, I can kayak when I want to. Uh, but I would certainly encourage, you know, I got into it because I am from a family of outdoor people and my family boats so I've never been discouraged from joining. Um, so I would second that. It's encouraging, you know, even if your, your kid likes to surf, maybe they like to, to kayak better. <laughs> and unless you encourage them to try, they're, they're not going to know. Um, but you know, from a from a parent standpoint, I would certainly encourage getting your kids out. We're encouraging them to try also. Um, but <coughs> I think also part of it is is making it accessible because if you if you don't come from a, a family of, of boaters, uh, kayakers, it's kind of hard to find that. It's kind of hard to get your your foot in it. You know, unless Unless you are brave enough to go to a, a beginning kayaking class on your own on a Saturday, you know, it's really hard to get, get in there. And I think that having it be a social thing and having it be something that you can try without committing too fully is very important because part of it is the gear, you know, unless you commit to having all of the gear, you know, which is a huge commitment, but having it so that you can just give it a try. You know, try one day with your friends um, is huge. So we had the opportunity to spend an afternoon at one on one surf sports a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And this, here's a place where you can rent equipment really inexpensively, mm -hmm. get on the water, and what do you know, the place was overrun with young people doing just that. What is the name of that store again? Could you say it just one more time? <laughs> There's a really key word in the name of that store. Do you surf. know what it is? It's surf, and surf is sexy. And so young people, I'm sorry, sea kayaking, no offense. It is not sexy. There is nothing sexy Even about with me. The skirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a bikini on. No, like And so I think, you know, 101 is able to capture a slightly different demographic than, than what, say, California Canoe and Kayak is able to capture. Um, one thing neither of us addressed, I, I dabble a little bit in stand up paddle boarding. It is, um, is, is dominated by women. In is it? Mm -hmm. Not a lot of clothes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Small um, clothes. For, for, you know, and that's a whole nother talk from somebody who has a lot more experience with the stand-up paddleboard community. But right from the, like, the beginning of that craze, it has really captured the interest of women. And, you know, we could... Because you can carry the boat. <laughs> I know, right? Because you can. You can carry the board. They, the women want tiny little boards. They throw it on their car. It seems, you know, it seems fun. It seems like surfing. It's, there's a whole variety of reasons that they love it. But, um... Can I jump in? There? Yeah, please. So, uh, what Jim was saying actually does hold true for recreational kayaking. I work for Sea Trek. Mm -hmm. On a hot weekend day, not just a paddleboard, but a sit on it. Yeah. So have a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. We see it too in uh, Jack London Square at California Canoe and Kayak. Anybody wandering through the square, you know, 
all minorities, women, young people, old people, all ages, just hopping on to sit on top and paddling out of the Oakland estuary. Right. They don't really, it's just a way to get on the water and cool off. Um, it's, it's that first step to sea kayaking. Remember I showed you guys those numbers of like, when they're like looking at a closed deck boat, thinking about trying to do rescues. You know, I see it when I'm working in the shop talking to people who are on the fence about sea kayaking. When I start talking about kind of what's involved in learning to sea kayak, some people, they just, it's a big commitment and they, they thank me and lock up the door. <laughs> So, um, to me, uh, what you were saying that being accessible is the key for young people. Um, I was, for a family reason, I was in Scotland and ended up paddling with some of the Scottish clubs up there, you know, and they were really very great. They gave me boats to paddle with. And their model of a club is uh, uh, they have warehouses, mm -hmm. they get some um, money from the state, very little because they are a non-profit organization, they buy boats. And then in the evening after work, they have one evening for kids, one evening for older people. And so basically they, it's accessible. Not that many people have boats, very few people have equipment, but the club has it. And there everybody kayaks mm -hmm. throughout the age group because it's accessible. Like I have a lot of people, I work in education, and I have a number of people that would love, because they know I kayak, and they say, when are you taking me out? When are you taking me out? <coughs> so I have two boats, and I can take people in the estuary. That's as much as I can do, right? But then I want to do also my own kayaking. I cannot spend uh, you know, my weekends doing a beginner, and beginner, and beginner every week. And really, uh, it's too much of a commitment for young people to rent all this equipment to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, there, I, the model they have as a club is great. Yeah. Because you make it really accessible. Yeah. That's one yeah. thing Europe has down, are their clubs. Yeah. Their kayak clubs are amazing. They've done a phenomenal job. They have clubhouses, they have equipment. You know, it's a that they didn't even have a clubhouse. It didn't matter. Yeah. The storage where the kayak are there. There are people that every mm -hmm. evening is volunteering to take people out, they have equipment, and they take people out. And they have a special night, they had a night only for teenagers. Mm -hmm. And it was packed, it, it, you know, and it was great to see. You know. This house collectively has so much equipment. Like, I've got like four kayaks. Mm -hmm. and, and I find that when taking young people out, and I've done a fair amount of that with a family of friends, that if the stuff is there, they just have to kind of show up and wear something. And if you've got a paddling jacket, mm -hmm. we have so much stuff to loan, it wouldn't be that hard for us to invite people and bring loaners. Yeah. It's a little more effort to load it all on the car and all that stuff. But that, uh, yeah. I have found, is really great just to get them out and then to do, for starting, just a short paddle, something that's fun, that involves something good to eat. And mm -hmm. it's like a nice little, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And, and just easy and fun, and just to so, to get the feel of what it's like to be on the water. Exactly. And that's really sexy stuff, and you know, once, you know, once you get the hang of that, then the rest gets easier. Mm -hmm. What I hear is that we have the young people, and Basque has all the gear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. So I'm thinking of an alliance. Okay. <laughs> Kelly and I, when, I, when we were in Taiwan, we met this gentleman who was getting more involved in the Taiwan Kayakers Association, which is a club in Taipei, in Taipei. It's really similar to Baskin um, in a lot of ways. But one thing that they just recently did was a few of the leaders got together and bought uh, a lot of kayaks for the clubs to use, for the club to use, and put them in containers. Um, That's what Bo does. Yeah. Uh, Bo does that? Bo. What do I do? But he, yeah, and then put containers by the water, uh, and everyone in the club has, you know, access to those to so just take them out whether, you know, whenever they want. And so that seems to be, we'll see how effective that is, but I think it, it is definitely modeled off of what you see more in Europe in mm -hmm. a traditional paddling club, or Berkeley paddling a rowing club. Um, being right there on the aquatic park there. Yeah, the rowing club, you know, I'm involved with the rowing club, and that's nice, because mm -hmm. you don't need to have any other equipment. The sea kayaking mm -hmm. is just a huge commitment. I can't see myself when I was younger. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 
Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I'm sure a few of you have more questions. Will you be available for some chatting? Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the meantime, we have a lot of stuff to put away, the chairs.